Welcome everyone to another episode of Streamed and Screened, an entertainment podcast about movies and TV from Lee Enterprises. I'm Terry Lipschitz, managing editor of the National Newsroom at Lee and co-host of the program with Bruce Miller, editor of the Sioux City Journal and a longtime entertainment reporter. And for this episode, Bruce, we're in Black History Month. We just we just entered February and it, it's very fitting, but there's a new program out there, a new limited series that's on uh, on the air right now. Right. It's uh, part of the genius kind of overlay. If you may remember, Ron Howard started this. He did Einstein quite a while ago. And then we had Aretha Franklin story as part of the genius. And now the genius is now this is like the odd title. OK, it's MLK slash X. And you're going Martin Luther King 10. What, what is this? It's like Creed. What is this? And no, what it is, is they've taken the two stories, the story of Martin Luther King Jr. and the story of Malcolm X, and put them together into one. The reason they did, the producers talked about it. The producers were going to do just the Martin Luther King Jr. story. And they decided, you know, no, there's another story here that we need to tell because we this story has been told. The Martin Luther King Jr. story has been told many times with a lot of different people, but there are untold stories that haven't really hit the light of a TV screen or a movie screen. And so they decided to mash it up, if you will. Um, Gina Prince Bythewood, if you know her, have you heard of her? She did Love and Basketball. She and her husband, Reggie, who's here with us, uh, we have Re Reggie and Gina, uh, worked together on A Different World. That's how they met. They started kind of spitballing this whole idea. What, what can we do? And here's what they had to say about putting the two civil rights leaders together in one miniseries. I'm curious, how did you decide to put the two of them together? Or you could do 10 hours on each one. We can do 20, you know. But we needed to do a different narrative. We need to do a narrative that answers the urgency of now. We needed to spell the idea that you have to either choose between Malcolm and Martin and rather look at it from a different lens, look at it from a lens that says, perhaps we needed both of them. Perhaps they are opposite sides of the same coin. And if we embrace the messaging of both of them, feel like there's a contemporary solution to a lot of the things we're seeing right now. You know, I, I was surprised because as I was growing up, Malcolm was always in the background. Mm -hmm. And Martin was always in the forefront. Mm -hmm. Will that change? Will we see Malcolm become just as, as important to the discussion of civil rights? We absolutely hope so. It's, it's interesting because so often it taught you have to choose. Do you follow Martin or do you follow Malcolm? And so often in history, Mal um, Malcolm's been villainized as well. So for us, we wanted to elevate both, show the importance of both, not only to the movement, but to each other. They absolutely fueled each other. They followed what each other was doing. They pushed each other. And as they neared the end of their lives, they were actually moving closer and closer um, to each other in, in the way that they wanted to go about achieving the same goal. But, you know, to Bruce's question as well, you know, will, will that change? I don't think the youth keep Malcolm in the background. I don't think that's the reality for particularly young um, black uh, adults. And it's, you know, Malcolm is very much at the forefront. Oh, that that's good to hear because uh, to me, he seems like a hipper leader than uh, Martin. Maybe that's just my take on things. Um, but I, I think there's a lot there that we can learn from him that just really doesn't get said. People don't even talk you know, in schools. I don't even know if they're teaching this anymore. Well, the autobiography of Malcolm X is challenged. Same with the letter of Birmingham at jail is 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 uh, banned in, in several parts of, of the country. You know, so the, this idea of it being taught and learned is um is something that we as artists, we as civilians, you know, we need to challenge. And also yeah. what so much of what Malcolm was, was talking about was really the dignity of self and and how important that was certainly at that time but any time for for us to hear that about ourselves and his push to be connected to our roots you know his pan-africanism was a big part of his message and 
that's absolutely as Red says urgency of now. We need to hear that message more than than ever. We were happy, so happy, one to learn more about Malcolm than we even knew, and then to put these fascinating things and his genius on display as well as Dr. King. When you go looking for people to play the parts, how difficult is that to find the right people? Well, we are we call them the big four, and we are so excited because we got four young actors who are extraordinary. And foremost, we wanted to cast them young because we wanted to reflect the actual ages of Dr. King and Malcolm X, Coretta and Betty when they were achieving these things. Though Dr. King was 26 when he led the march, uh, the Montgomery bus boycott. Um, when you portray them at that age, then again, young people can see, I can achieve that too. So we needed young actors who had shops, which all four of them do, but also the courage to take on these roles and the commitment that it takes uh, and also the consciousness to know you have to get this right. You're not doing an invitation. Find your own Malcolm and Martin bedding credit inside yourself and, and bring that forth. And, and they did that in a beautiful way. So when you're filming it, do you do one part all at once and then you do the other part all at once? Or how do you, it looks like a technical, like, how do I do this? No, it was it was basically you know, filmed at the at the same time, you know, it was really more dependent on location or, you know, the schedule, whatever was complementary to the schedule. You know, this was really also interesting narrative and an interesting um, opportunity for Gene and I, because it's the first time that we came up with an idea and didn't write it or direct it ourselves. And so we brought in a really great team, showrunners, um, Raphael Jackson, Damian Macedon, and uh, Jeff Stetson, who wrote a seminal piece of work uh, called the called the meeting, wrote our, our our pilot. Just a really great, committed team of people that put it together. Um, the technical part of it was also just really fun in terms of like the merging and the intersecting, and when we got into editing and playing with that and the music and just times we go to Malcolm, times we go to Martin, and the challenge is like always moving the story forward so that while we're dealing with different people, it's still one narrative. Did you ever feel like, oh, I wish I had my hands on this. I wish I was writing this. I wish I was directing this. You know, the re reality is, you know, I was I was working on, a, on another show called Swagger. Gina was working on The Woman King. It was such a crazy time. It was just a different it challenge, a different way to use our creative muscle to convey ideas, to convey vision, and to allow them to have the space to bring forward what they wanted to bring. When you both started, did you think the career would lead to this? Yeah, I would say yes. I mean, we we met on the show called The Different World. We were hired a week apart, and that was over 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but Reg and I, like how we connected, we started on a friendship level, and it was this shared belief, an unabashed belief that what we do could change the world and respect and understanding of the power of this platform that we love. And so we've never let go of that. We've never become disillusioned by that. We know the impact the work can have. And so this feels really great for us. And I think one of the great things is, as Reg said, to be able to be a place in our career where we can have a vision for something or an idea and then bring an incredible group together to realize that vision and also give opportunities to others as well. It was so crazy, Bruce. Um, here's a story. I always have a story, by the way. Here's a story. So when it was the uprising around uh, Rodney King and, and the verdict came in and those officers were officers found not guilty and like everything in LA just was percolating. And this was like before cell phones and all that stuff. Gina went to this church out in the South Central. I went to that church in South Central just like we needed somewhere to go. Um, without even connecting with each other, we were both there. And, you know, we spoke. Just having like moments like that where you just talk about like the world and how we've seen it change, how it needs to change and what we can do as artists to just make it better. Is, you know, really filmmaking isn't just something we do. It's something we believe in. Oh, that's so great to hear. Well, keep doing it. Don't be stopping any time now. I, I'll, I'll be very upset if you do. So please, please keep going. Thank you so much. All right, Bruce. Thank you for that interview. It sounds fascinating. I mean, kind of. I, I had that same thought. Is here are two iconic 
civil rights leaders, but they had different approaches. But in a lot of ways, they were still very similar people. So it, it does make sense to bring that story together. Well, and, you know, they had um, different followings, too. They all had the same goal, but they were approaching it in different ways. And that's kind of the fascinating thing, because we've seen movies about each of them. If you may remember, Denzel Washington played Malcolm X. Um, we just had David Oyelowo in Selma as Martin Luther King Jr. So there have been people who have played these roles. And I was surprised that, you know, A, somebody would say, yeah, I want to play that. That's already been nominated for an Oscar by somebody else. But they were looking for younger. They went young, young, younger because they want to show those early years when they were just starting out. And one of the things that surprised me was um, Coretta Scott King was a huge opera singer. Did you know this? No, I had no idea. This was something that was all news to me. And that came out in the process of this this miniseries. And it did surprise producers as well. But they were looking for people who could play those roles. Now, they found Kelvin Harrison Jr., and you've seen him in a number of things, for Martin. But they were looking for a Malcolm. Where could we find a Malcolm? And they found him in Great Britain. Uh, they found Aaron Pierre is his name. Aaron Pierre, if you want to give it a French spin. But he says that when he went to school, they didn't really study American civil rights leaders. So his his exposure has a different kind of meaning than what it did for Calvin. But the two actors uh, talk about the work, and they also talk about Ron Cephas Jones. Ron Cephas Jones, who was on This Is Us and won two uh, Emmy Awards for that, died not too recently, I think just this last summer. And he Elijah Muhammad in this and what it was like for them to work with him in what may be his last performance. So we have for you, Kelvin Harrison Jr. He's the American one when you listen to him. And then Aaron Pierre, who is the um, uh, British one. And you'll hear, you'll, you'll be able to differentiate the two of them, but them talking about the roles and the film they've got coming up. They're both together in another film, oddly enough, that they started making before they did MLK slash X. Aaron, how do they teach these civil rights leaders in Great Britain? Do they do they talk about them much in, in schools or not? I mean, I think with a question like that, it's important that I share my personal experience. Um, you know, I can't speak for everybody's experience. And me personally, um, I, I didn't experience it being taught, I'll say as much as I would have liked, in secondary school um, and prior to that, but I was fortunate to have parents who were deeply informed and made it a priority to inform me of what they knew and also made it a priority to encourage me to seek out further information beyond what they shared with me. So when the both of you have seen others play these roles, is that like daunting? Is that you know, kind of scary when you think Denzel played this, David Oyelowo played that. I mean, how do you approach it? Of course it's scary. It's so it's, it's so intense. You just kind of like, whoa. Like these people I look up to and respect and like watch their round tables and their interviews because I want to like, I want to figure out how to act like them and like, how do I get there? Those are all the questions that run through your head. And now you're sitting there faced with the same task. And I'm so much, I'm not, I mean, I was about to say something. Well, we're younger than them. I think <laughs> they're very young still. Um, but it's, it's intimidating, but that's part of the, that's part of the exciting part of being an actor is that we get to go on these incredible adventures and you get to face your fears. You get to face these tasks that feel much bigger than you and much larger than you. And you have to figure out how do I navigate it? Um, what about me is going to be able to, to, to meet the challenge? Um, and, and there's growth in that. And I think when those two men said yes to that role, it was no different from the one we said yes to the role. I th I'm sure they were like insecure and scared and wondering if they could do it as well. But I don't think they regret it. And I felt that when I took it, I was like, as hard as this may be, I don't know what I'm saying yes to completely. I don't know what I'm inviting into my life. But I know that when I come out of it, I'm going to be a better person. My character's going to be stronger and I'm going to have more knowledge than I did before. So and I don't see anything wrong with that. Right. And I think just just to add on to that, uh, what Kelvin said there is so true. It's it's a it's a daunting undertaking. It's it's the, the magnitude of that undertaking is huge. And you feel 
you question your capacity, you question your ability, you question whether you have the endurance, the, the durability, you feel exposed, you feel vulnerable. Um, and to still step into, into that journey, I think is something that neither of us will regret. Mm -hmm. And, um, I feel very privileged. We feel very privileged yeah. to have had the opportunity to serve these great men and women. When you were making it, did you guys get to talk much or were you on your own kind of paths that you're each doing your own part of the, of the film? We, I mean, we, we spoke. So the first day we did the meeting, the actual, the scene of the meeting, that was our first day of shooting, which was kind of was wild of them to do to us. <laughs> and then, um, but from there, we kind of went on our separate paths. This, the, it was almost like there were two shows in, in a, a little bit. And one show would kind of go on in the top of the day, the other show would come on and we would see each other in passing. But you know, that's what made it so exciting was like, I would get whispers about what was happening on the Malcolm X side. I would get whispers and it felt like the current events that Martin was experiencing being like, oh, Malcolm X is doing this over in, in the North. You know, and it, it would fuel me even harder. I would be like, oh, and I would also hear Aaron's approaching it this way, you know, and it kind of um, it, it, it helped mirror the the experience that I think they were um, kind of having in a very small way. Um, and it filled it. It filled it. You both get an opportunity to preach. What is that experience like? Is that really kind of powerful when you're behind the pulpit and you're and you're talking to a congregation that's responding? It, it, it's it's a beautiful experience and um, it, it's very immersive. Um, we, we were very fortunate to have phenomenal background artists join us and uh, love on us and support us um, during these days where we had these these speeches and these sermons. And it, it's it's so critical to have, uh, you know, a team that is prepared to sit with you for all those hours while you get all the different angles of that speech and stay uh, equally as enthralled from the first take to the 150th take, you know, so we're, we're deeply grateful to, uh, to everyone involved in those, in those, you know, very special moments, you know. You're both in the Lion King too. Was that before that or before? Yeah. I mean, it's, how does this work out? Do they say, oh, they're really good at this thing. Let's put them in Lion King. I wanted it as well, to be honest. We started Lion King before we started it. Uh, we and Aaron were working on Zoom, um, I guess a year before we started the show, or maybe a year and a half. And you had, you had your you had your braids. The, and I was doing Chevalier. Like I, we, I've gone through a few different right. characters during this process. <laughs> Lion King is a yeah. That's a whole other thing. But it was cool because we we. But I only knew Aaron as Mufasa because <laughs> he's so committed. I literally only I, I would see him and it'll be like a good morning and then we move on. So the first time we actually met was on this set. Wow, that's that's unreal. That's unreal right there. So it keeps it keeps on going. What? What was it like working with Ron Sipas Jones? Was he, uh, I would assume, remarkable? Yeah, uh, remarkable is an understatement. He 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 was a father figure to not only me but all of us, and he really took me under his wing and was abundantly generous with his not only his artistic knowledge and insight but his personal life, knowledge, and insight. And for that reason, I'm deeply grateful to him. And I'm deeply grateful to have had the privilege to collaborate and and learn from uh, one of the greatest to ever do it. Um, he's phenomenal. This is a great tribute to his, his life and his work, I think. But thank you both so much and great good luck. I can hardly wait for Lion King now. You're, yeah. you're getting me all excited, right? Thank you. I'm so excited. <laughs> thank you, man. All right, Bruce, thank you again for that set of interviews. Um, real fascinating. And yeah, they're going to be uh, back at it on the screen in, in kind of opposite roles. Not quite MLKX, but sort of in these opposing roles. Scar and Mufasa. Scar and Mufasa and the Lion King. Yeah. These guys yeah, could work so together for years. They could be in a whole bunch of things where it's like a twofer, right? They could. Yeah. Yeah. This is a, so this is an interesting program. Uh, it, it is a mini series. It's two episodes a week. I believe it's eight total. So it's all through the month of February. Uh, I think the first one's dropped, what, February 1st, right? So it's, 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 you can see them now. You can start seeing them now. So it's uh, the, the Na National Geographic channel, Nat Geo, whatever. That's, I guess, the hipper name. Like, we're not National Geographic, we're Nat Geo. But they're, uh, they're going to show, they're going to premiere on Nat Geo. And then I think it's the next day they move to Disney Plus and Hulu. So, 
you you're not you can't avoid it. So if you're if you're looking for it, you can find them all over. Yep, exactly. So you know through cable, your cable network, or if you subscribe to one of those. But yeah, this this sounds like a really fascinating one. I already clicked the little plus button in my Disney Plus to add it to my uh, watch up next because I'm I'm loaded up with programming right now. I am no shortage. As you heard the producers, this is an important time for this story. Because so much is going on that it's time to revisit that so you re realize where people have been and what work still needs to be done. So it And it's very fascinating. Like I say, I was surprised by some of the things I learned. It's fun to see new people play these characters. You know, you get a, another kind of wrinkle onto what the, the personality always was. Absolutely. I, I don't like it when stories get told and retold over and over again. Like, I don't need the same biopic multiple times spider-man right exactly like i can only take so many so many versions of batman and spider-man and all that but when you do this type of story you know if you do the one where it, it's showing them later in life or you take a different like the fact that they took these two stories which have been told either through documentaries or through cinema or, or some other method but now you're bringing them together and telling them you know, in, in a simultaneous story to kind of to kind of show like, you know, yeah, they're we think of them differently now. You know, history looks back at them differently and we see them as being taking two separate approaches. But they their goal was the same. It's civil rights. It's it's equality for everybody. And oddly, they only had one meeting that's documented of the, the two men together. They said that they were basically making two films at once. And, you know, they'd be running all around to try and make sure we've got uh, this story is going here and we're doing this one over here. And and it would be a, a scheduling nightmare, I would think. But um, they're able to pull it off and then pull it all together. And you get this and I think it's it's quite good. Yeah. You know, it's fascinating. And, and this is totally unrelated, but it's sort of in that same concept of of screen time together. If you think back to uh, into the 1990s when um, uh, Michael Mann did heat right and and it was being billed as like it's de niro it's pacino the movie was three and a half hours long and what did they have like five minutes sitting at a diner together and that was it right <laughs> that's it that's what that's all you have to do if you want to billboard the names there you are but um and i, I do think it's an innovative approach it'll be interesting to see where genius goes beyond this what else who else is considered genius and what realm are they in because i truthfully i as much as i love aretha and Aretha has been very nice to me over the years. I did not see her in this this kind of format. I didn't think that her story was right for that. But when they poured it out and they showed how she was a genius, it made perfect sense. So I think this could go in a, in a bunch of directions if they wanted to. So we'll see. You know, could it be Oprah and Gail at some point? You never know. These types of stories are just really really fascinating you know one one more before we we kind of close out this episode but it's another new program um and, and i guess in a sense it's it's you know maybe maybe appropriate for this time of year too but it's uh netflix did that documentary on the making of we are the world right where they were looking for you know the song that would raise money through usa for africa to help for for, for the poor in in africa and it was a really like we heard the song. We've heard that song so many times. I remember I could you couldn't escape it. But going back and they're talking to Lionel Richie and how he had to work on the song with Michael Jackson. And then they get, you know, Stevie Wonder involved and and the producers and and all these, you know, A-listers. And it was it was recorded immediately after the American Music Awards that night. So Lionel Richie hosted all these all these musicians were there receiving their awards and then they basically bolted after that. And, and it was just kind of like a fascinating look. So, you know, when you can tell these types of stories in a different way, um, I think it really, it really enhances what we already know. The documentary you're talking about is on Netflix and it's unbelievable. If you were for that time and you see those people, unbelievable, put it on the list as well, because that's, that's a must view to see that many talents in one room and how they react with one another unbelievable i think that you know one of the more interesting pieces in that too was because you you know that they're all these they're all these geniuses right so they're all these fascinating people they're they're a-listers every single one of them but when you stick them all in the room together 
how their personalities change. And I thought the most fascinating one was watching how uncomfortable Bob Dylan looked being in that room. Right. You know, he was just standing there and he would kind of mumble the words because the song is outside of his vocal range. Cause that's not, he's not a pop singer. He's a, a, a folk singer with a raspy voice. So, and I think that there was somebody like, uh, he wonder helped him get his whole. Yeah. Bye. Right. He was like, able, they, he was a big imitator of everybody and he knew how to sing like, like Dylan. And so he showed him how you got to do it like that. And that's how he learned it. Yeah. Yeah. It was funny. They said like Stevie can kind of mimic anybody and he's at the piano doing his little Bob Dylan thing. And it was hilarious to listen to. And then the other one that was really kind of interesting also is just Waylon Jennings tapping out. Like, I can't, I can't do this. This is, this is like, it's cool and all, but I I just, I can't sing it. He just, well, and then you had, Diana Ross saying, I'd like to get people to autograph my music. <laughs> right. Really? Exactly. You know, yeah. so who is the big, who was the big one in the room? That's I, I, the question that you probably have to ask is who was the most important one in that room? Yeah. I don't know. That's a good question. But they checked the egos at the door. So there you go. They did. Yeah. No, it was really, it was really fascinating. So check, you know, obviously check out Genius MLK slash X. Check that out. And then, of course, the the making of We Are the World is on Netflix, along with tons of other great programming coming up. And, um, you know, Bruce is, uh, you know, meeting with the stars, the celebs, the A-listers this week. And, um, you know, we'll be back again with another episode of Streamed and Screen before you know it. Mm-hmm.